less stress, more time, more money. Welcome to the Cash Flow Contractor, Deep Dive. Martin, I got a, I got an important question for you. Sir. To start us off. What is the worst decision you ever made? <laughs> might be podcast. <laughs> I, wow, it might be. It might be. Man, that's a that is a good question. But I'd have to. Uh... The worst decision you've ever made. Okay, an honest answer is I've made a bunch of them, and some of them I would never tell anybody because there were things that violated my values, mm. and I would never tell anybody because yeah. uh, decisions that violate your values really stab you in the heart. Mm -hmm. But Every decision I've made has led me to where I am right now. Yeah. Uh, my abilities with a coach, I have people tell me they, co they want to coach with a guy who's got gray hair. And I tell them, well, I've got some coming in, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you've got, are those cameras colored or are they black and white? Because <laughs> you got a full head. No, if you pay attention to everything you've done, the good decisions and the bad decisions, they bring you to where you are. No, absolutely. So, uh, that's a, often the worst decisions help you become who you are and help you to learn how to make good decisions. Yeah. You know, you have to have some of the bad ones as well. Um, oh, the bad ones are the ones that stick. Oh, yeah. They really do. And they help you refine your values and remind you of who you are and identify them, yeah. all those things. So um, I asked that question because oftentimes with our topic today of firing, um, we think that it's going to be a terrible decision and we're going to regret it or we're hurting someone's life. And yeah, all those things could be true, you know. Um, but it's oftentimes not the employees that you fire that cause chaos and headache for you, but it's the ones that you don't fire. Man, that's good. We're, that sounds like Harvard. It that's sounds, kind of stuff it, you'd it's expect It's directly from Harvard, Harvard Business Review. Uh, I read it. Great quote. Let me read it like word for word. It's not the people you fire who make your life miserable. It's the ones you don't. Right. So, right. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people sitting out there knowing in their mind, man, so-and-so is slacking, so-and-so is not motivated, so-and-so hasn't, you know, just been engaged at their company. Should we fire him? Should we not? And the reality is you've been mulling that decision over for sometimes years, and it's making you miserable. And it's making you miserable because you haven't fired him because you're worried about making the wrong decision so right and these i think the reason this subject comes up is as a coach these things tend to run in packs i mean i have people with severe cash flow problems probably a lot of the time <laughs> or you know marketing issues or whatever they kind of run in groups but here recently i've had three people in the last week who are dealing with this issue of having to fire somebody and over the last maybe two months probably five five or six people wow. Where the owner is is struggling with a difficult decision, mm -hmm. and we may have people listening who don't have any trouble at all yeah. with firing people. But out of the 400 clients I've had, I really can't think of one. Yeah, you know there are those guys out there. Get the hell off my job, you know. But it is a difficult thing for people to do. So much so, if you recall, when Larry Hughes, the business broker we had on. Yeah. said when you're optimizing the price of your business or the, the value of your business, when he walks in, one of the great difficulties, ooh, I just thought of another guy who's having a problem, so that brings it to four right now. But when he walks in to value a business, try to make it efficient, get the profits up. So right. one of the first thing he always confronts is they have dead weight people, mm -hmm. people who are not pulling their weight, not recovering the value of what they cost the company, occupying yeah. a seat, keeping somebody qualified. Yeah. And that's one of the hard things. And that's why people who buy businesses oftentimes get the bad rap of being a, yeah, you know, a hatchet man or whatever they call it. They're just bringing in, fired all the people, all they care about is money, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And what they're really doing is cleaning up a mess that's accumulated over the years mm -hmm. of people who aren't carrying their weight. Yeah. And there are all sorts of reasons that uh, people um, keep people. And I think we'll get into them, but one of the, one of the, things I like to say is that sometimes, and in my career, it probably been four times where it was just a delight to fire somebody. <laughs> and in every case, it involves stealing. When you catch somebody stealing, 
it's uh, it's easy. It's easy. Although, and, although, I know. Well, I had a client uh, about a year ago, and somebody caught red-handed stealing from him and kept her on. Well, she's been a loyal employee all these years. She's going, what? She's stealing from you. Well, you know, no. Well, I think it, it really the we have to be clear about stealing because in reality, I think most firing comes down to stealing in one form or another. Stealing time, right. stealing away from the culture, stealing away from... I'm talking about stealing I know, money. you're thinking, you're talking about actual theft from right. like money or supplies or right. whatever it is. But most of the time, it, it really does come back to stealing from the company in the form of taking away culture, taking away time that should be dedicated to the company, taking away performance that should be given to the company. I mean, that's kind of what it boils down to, um, in my opinion. But yeah, I think a lot of people are waiting for those miracles, if you will, of like, just make them do something completely blatantly obvious or that quit. goes, yeah, or quit, yeah. Uh, find something better, you know, because they don't want to go in and have that conversation. Yeah, I've, I uh, kind of put it in three categories, general categories of why people hate to hate fire people. And mm -hmm. the first one's empathy. Oh, yeah. Somebody's a, a good guy or a good lady, and they yeah. come to work every day, and they're nice. And if you fire them, you are telling them that you are not succeeding. Mm -hmm. And they have to go tell their family. Yeah. You may put them under a little financial duress. So it's just that empathy of thinking how you would would feel if somebody fired you. Yeah. Uh, the second one is doubt. Um, I hear this all the time. All the time. Did I give them a chance? Did I give them the training they needed? Did I really work with them so was it clear what, what they needed to do to succeed here? And you doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, did you do those things? I right. mean, that is, what, that is your responsibility as the boss or the owner or the manager or whatever position it is to, to give clear expectations, to give people the tools they need to succeed and to give them the opportunity to succeed, the resources, the training, yeah. the opportunity to succeed. But if you've done that, maybe you didn't do it perfectly. And that's where people beat themselves up. I, well, I did train them, but I guess they didn't get it. So I wasn't clear. I always ask this question, did they do a little extra to come to you and mm -hmm. say, I didn't understand this task. This is what I tried to do. How could I do it better? So it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. Should be a two-way street. And oftentimes it's not. I just see people that, um, that they just they just they take it on themselves yeah. even though it went to an outsider me it's just really obvious yeah. um, so empathy and doubt about um, did they really do it am I measuring it right in fairness did I did I give them a chance did I give them all the tools and the resources they need well you do need to ask those questions but not not to absolve yourself of a burden but if you're not doing those things, meaning uh, teaching them and, and training yeah. them up and giving them attention and telling them how they're going to be measured, mm -hmm. you know, I want this done at this time, but at this quality, yeah. so that they know, you need to correct those things. But if you have done those things materially and it's yeah. been a while and they're just not there, then, then they're not a fit for your company. Well, I, I think it, every process is designed to get the results that it gets, right? And I think that the issue is for a lot of employers, especially small business owners, contractors that are, you know, doing the HR for their company, um, and even managers that are managing other people, what's your process for keeping a pulse on those things? Right. I'm not an expert on this topic. I've only had to fire two people ever. Um, I think I've had a lot more experience in other things outside of business, like coaching, where I've essentially fired players. Hey, you're not starting today. Hey, you're not, you know, I'm having to make those decisions all the time. But as far as in the workplace, I think probably why I haven't had to fire so many people, not that I've had millions of employees or hundreds of employees, but I really do make an intentional effort to meet with employees regularly, at least bi-weekly, um, having a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And then we're also doing quarterly reviews. Bi-weekly, is that every two weeks or every five two, a week? Every two okay. weeks. Yeah. But also, you know, we're having a team meeting once a, once a week. Okay. So I'm seeing them all the time in an intentional setting. And then we're also having regularly scheduled every other week meetings. And for some employees that are directly underneath me, it's every week. 
that manage other people. So more manager related, but having that intentional one-on-one -on -one meeting allows you to work through some of those things. If you're just seeing them for five minutes on this job and then you don't feel like you're seeing the results, but you can't have that intentional conversation where you can come back to, Hey, did you do this? Did you do this? If you're not having that quarterly review where it's really clear, Hey, we evaluated on this. This is what you need to work on. Um, you're not going to be able to feel confident about your decision. You're always going to second guess, well, did I really give him a shot? But if you had a system set up to where you were constantly meeting with your employee, you were going through what they need to work on, giving them performance evaluations, those kinds of things, then you would have a much better confidence going into those com those conversations. And that, that is the burden of a manager. Um, abdication versus delegation. Delegation is instructions you're handing off clear expectations yep. and you're measuring the results on a regular basis. Abdication is just go do it and then you get mad at them because they didn't do it, do it the way you wanted it, but they didn't know what that was. And it's a struggle. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm perfect at it. You know, I struggle with it every week, but make that intentional effort to get something on the calendar, make it a default that it's a system. Once you have the system in place, it's not based on how you're feeling that day or how busy you are that week or whatever it is. Well, here's a, uh, it's, it's, the actual thing is more complicated than I'm going to describe it, but a simple method, it's called a scrum. Yep. And it, it's used in technology and all this, it, woo -hoo, big deal. But, <laughs> but a scrum is a 10 minute meeting. Yep. And you can have it weekly or you can have it every morning. And yep. I'm thinking of contractors trying to get out to the jobs and get the material yep. picked up and the craziness that goes on. But a scrum has these elements. <laughs> what did we say we were going to do yesterday? What did we actually do? What are you going to do today? And what do you need for me to help you? Yep. And I mean, we're talking 10 minutes. And that, that accountability of what did you say you were going to do yesterday? I was going to get that sidewalk poured. Did you pour the sidewalk? No. Or yes, I did, but I'm not finished. Uh, what are you going to do today? I'm going to finish that sidewalk. Mm -hmm. What do you need from me? Well, it really helped if somebody brought the skid steer over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, on you go. But it's a daily contact, clarity. Let, one, one of the big fallacies is to assume that people understood what you told them. Yeah. I mean, that's communication 101. And expectations are being set every single day. Right. You're going back and revisiting those expectations right. the next day, those kind of Clarifying things. Clarifying things for people. Yeah. I, I think a big thing there is setting the expectations, but I love the aspect of how can I help you? I feel like that's not asked enough by managers, owners, and maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like most managers and owners are sitting there and saying, I need this from you. I need this. I need this. They're not really asking, what do you need from me? Right. And that goes, you know, in the two firings that I've had to do, and they've not been in serious roles by any means. I'm really fortunate to have really good people on our team. Um, they've been really part-time employees. Um, in both of the cases, I knew something was wrong. But before I said I need better, I said, hey, it looks like your, your performance is not up to par. What do you need from me? What can I do to help you succeed at this role? And if you go into it with that mindset, it, and then they still, and you provide those things that they ask for, because they're usually, they don't ask for much or what they ask for is very reasonable. And if they're still not performing, then it's a very clear, hey, I, I gave you this, I did this, this is what we talked about last time. And now it's just, it's not working out. I, I feel like it's, so there's something out there better for you. You know, it, it just, you're not motivated. You're not really giving it an effort. And usually that's what it comes down to. And, and unless it's some crazy thing, like they stole machinery or whatever right. well, it was. Well, like I said earlier, that's, those are the easy things. Those are the easy all ones. that doubt, that empathy, yeah. that fairness there, it's all answered. Yep. But that just, we just don't get to do that very often. Yeah, absolutely. And so taking the approach of, hey, how can I help you? What, what do you need? And actually providing them with extra equipment or whatever it is, extra materials, more time, uh, different schedule, whatever they ask for. Uh, if you're able to do that and they still don't show performance, it's a lot easier. Hey, I've set you up for everything you need. And then you can say, it looks like you just don't want it. And that's, that's usually what it comes down to if in those situations and from my experience. Well, I think people like specific things and um, to look for in people. I mean, yeah. you, you already know it. And most of the, 
if somebody needs to go. We had Tammy Hasselwander on here <laughs> a number of episodes again, and she said she just hated to fire people, and she'd keep them around way too long. <clears throat> and then one morning she'd walk downstairs and do it. Yep. And I think we asked her, well, what changed? She goes, I, I don't know. It, it just, like, finally occurred to me. This isn't working. This isn't working. Yeah. And it's not just a benefit to you. You're not just a greedy business owner. It's the livelihood of your business and the people who are still there and the mm-hmm. customers that you serve and the supplier you serve and the landlord you serve if you're renting. You owe it to them to be around. Yeah. And you can't have – parasites is a hard word. But you can't have bleeding all the time yeah. because you're – scared or a misguided sense of fairness yeah is is directing you and kind of the things that matter of fact i said it's been happening a lot in the last 10 days i got a text right as we started recording oh yeah from a client um one of these clients and he did it this morning he terminated a very important employee and the yeah, issue significant. there was um this guy happens to be super efficient yeah. in everything he does that's his thing and as a result, in his industry, he has better lead times, he's more consistent, he's making more money, doesn't pay the overtime his predecessors paid. There are just a lot of wonderful things going on because what he is doing is building systems. If he sees something that takes six steps, he figures out a way to make two steps out of it. And then he tells everybody, you now have to do these two steps. Well, depending, some people like change, some people don't. Yeah. You know, some people are on board, some people aren't. That's kind of the key distinction. But this person just said, you're driving me crazy with all these steps. And this person said, I'm ready to go a different direction. Yeah. And I, it was not to be released. <laughs> this person wanted to buy part of the company. And so uh, we talked it over for a long time, all the options. Can we sell part of it? Would that be an advantage? Could they be a co-owner? Could they be independent? And we finally decided, no, this person's uh, values and priorities were completely at odds with what my client was trying to do. And we decided this person has to go. Yeah. And that's what happened right, I got the text, right when we started recording. So he had to have the courage because this person was important in duties and also brought a lot of sales to the company. So our presumption is, well, we'll get those sales back. Our presumption is we're not gonna, we're gonna lose all those sales. Yep. This person has their own set of customers. Uh, we're gonna lose them all. I mean, I don't think we will lose them all. We will lose some. But this person, very obviously, there's a little more history to it than what you're... But they're yeah. very obviously thought she had our guy backed into a corner. And we just said, well, you cannot accept that. Other people, that's uh, Christine Sexter. And it's one of her, uh, it's on one of her pieces of material. I'm not sure she originated it, but said, nothing will ruin a good employee faster than watching you tolerate a bad employee. Absolutely. They're getting away with it. They're not engaged. So what are you looking for in an employee? And uh, the old saying is you hire for skill and fire for attitude. Mm -hmm. And the problem with attitude is it's everything we've been talking about. Well, what's an attitude? You know, I mean, they're not talking back in front of people, but man, they're working on something and there are two lines from finishing it and it's five o'clock and they slam the book shut, finish it tomorrow. There's no engagement. And what you're looking for in employees is passion. I mean, do they obviously want to be there? And I always say, does an employee ever do a little bit of extra? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not trying to screw them out of overtime, but just a display that they're engaged in what they do. And if you've got employees who are not engaged, I mean, that's something you can look for Yeah. Uh, as a qualifier. Are they passionate at all? Do they ask a lot? Do they want to learn about it? Do they bring you some ideas? Hey, I saw this on YouTube. It's really cool. Yep. It's a $45,000 piece of equipment, but it could really help us. I don't know if you can, but anyway, I just wanted you to know about it, you know? Yeah. Um, they they say things like, it's it's not my job, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, employees who say that. These are things you can look for on somebody that you can kind of quantify in your own mind to justify why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, they're... They don't take initiative, you know, they're unpredictable and unreliable. They're, mm-hmm. you know, they're, you know, a lot of things are going on, but they're sick on Friday. Well, people get sick uh, or hurt my back or something. I mean, people, those things happen and I'm not talking about, but they seem to happen a lot to certain people <laughs> and usually Friday or Monday, right? Yeah. Uh, just this, that kind of sign. Um, missed deadlines, they, they're insolent, don't respect their teammates. 
Mm-hmm. Um, they overstep boundaries. Mm-hmm. I, uh, <laughs> when I first got out of college, I went to work for grain elevators, and we had a scrum in the mornings. Yeah. A new guy came, and the boss was standing there telling everybody what to do. And once you go take corn out of bin 12, you know, going around, got to this new guy and told him what to do. And he said, well, let me ask you a question. <laughs> We're looking at him. I, don't, I didn't even know his name at that time. He, he asked the boss, he goes, what are you going to do to that? And I thought, ooh. <laughs> guy, boss looks at him and says, I'm going to go in there and try to make sure there's a company here so you got a job tomorrow. But anyway, that guy lasts about four days. But obviously... Yeah. I don't want to say he didn't get his place, but he didn't see himself as part of the team. He's like, mm-hmm. well, I mean, I'm, you're telling me what, I'm going to tell you what to do. So, yeah. so when, when you spot those things, they give you a checklist to kind of run through and say, this is why. Yeah. And one, one other thing, too, is, man, your employees are not your buddies. It's hard, man. I mean, it is hard. You work with them every day. You see the good ones doing extra, and you respect them for it. You love them for it. You often think, man, where would I be without Ralph or Sue or whatever? But they're not your buddies. You're still, yeah. It, and that, and, and that I, is really hard. I totally understand that approach. And I, I disagree in some regards, just because I have a different perspective. I, I agree in probably the same sense that you are saying they're not your buddies. I care deeply about my employees. Uh, in fact, a lot of them, I, I would say they're friends. Um, but if you truly care about your friends, you can't watch them dig a ditch for themselves. You know, w- what I'm trying to get at is, you know, if Ethan, are you listening? Over there? <laughs> what, like I'll, I'll take, I'll do an analogy for coaching. For example, okay. if you're, you're a parent and your, your son or daughter is playing a sport and you're the parent that is making sure that, you know, you give the coach a little something extra on his birthday and yeah. around Christmas time and time. you bring him, you know, a, a drink to every game from Sonic and, you know, you're, you're talking to him afterwards and helping them with their stuff outside of soccer so they, they can be set up and getting them deals at the car dealership, all that stuff. Well, these are getting better. <laughs> no, man, you see it left and right in, in soccer, especially. I'm sure it happens in every sport, though. Essentially acting as their booster, you know, and... If you're doing that so that your kid can get playing time, are you really helping your kid? No, you're not. Because as soon as that kid goes on to play college soccer where you can't really do that stuff, or they go on to play a more competitive team where the coach isn't having it, if you're playing that political game for your child, you're only digging a hole for your child because they think that they deserve that spot. And that translates into every other area of life. They're the same kind of parents that call the teacher whenever the kid makes a mistake and thinks and says sounds like the teacher made a mistake are you really the teacher's the one that made the mistake not your you know adolescent child who was on their phone for the entire class right. you know it, it's the same thing if if you really loved your child then you would let them learn on their own and make their own mistakes and earn their spot on the team and earn their grades um you know and earn their their job and their wage and pay for insurance and car and all that stuff. That's how you really protect or care for your child and set them up for success. Cause that's not how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be in the real world. They have to earn everything. Now going back to employees with friends, taking that same analogy, if you really care about your friend, one, you know that I always go into the approach that like, this is not, this is a step. Benali, my company is a stepping stone for my employees, right? I want them to go on and do great things. Maybe they can do it here, but only, but, I want them to do great things in their life, right? And if that's the, pr- the perspective I have, if they're not doing a good job here and I'm coddling them as a friend and setting them up to have, you know, the best job ever where they don't have to try and, you know, there's so much slack. You're not truly really helping. I'm not truly helping them in that path. Well, I agree with you. The people I've worked with over the years, I'm going to say it this way. Sorry, cash flow contractors, but I said you can love them. But they're still not your buddy. Sure. I mean, it, they're not your responsibility. There is a point, you have a different burden. Yeah. You have that sort of Damocles, if you've heard that podcast, hanging over your head. And there come a time when you have to make a decision. I mean, yeah. in, in the military, you have to send a guy up that hill with yeah. a high likelihood he's going to get killed. So you have to be able to make decisions about your company. And if, if the friendship is, if there isn't, 
a thin veneer of difference there. Yeah. That, okay, I'm going, that's where the agony comes from. All the people mm -hmm. I'm dealing with right now, that's all we're talking about. Oh, they're really sick, you know, and, and maybe they even tried, but I go, really, did they try, you know, really? And you have to be able to, to take the intermediate steps where you try to improve them. That's a scrum, make mm -hmm. it clear mm -hmm. what's expected, how they're being measured, give them the tools and the training to do it, and then do they do it or not it comes down to them. If they don't, you have to let them go. Uh, and and that is what I'm trying to say by that is, yes, you have to let them go because that's how you can best care for them as a buddy or a friend. Right. I mean, well, they're not going to, I mean, that's how not a lot of people see it. Maybe I see it differently, but if you really care about them, if that's what you're dealing with, you're struggling like, man, I care about them. I don't want them to be clear. Out I, know, of I agree with that hundred percent. I'm just saying a lot of people don't see oh, it. Oh no, they way. don't. You're see just it. greedy. But, it, but if, yeah, if, if, if you're struggling because man, they've got kids, they're a good friend. Like, what are we going to do? They go to church with us, whatever it is. You're not helping them by keeping them around. Right. You're there, hurt, you're hurting them. <laughs> there's a, you really are, and and that's one of the, uh, without going globally political, but that's one of the things that's going on in the country today. Everybody thinks that give something to somebody helps them, and it might in the immediate if you don't have a place to sleep and no food to eat. But once that's done, you keep giving. You are not helping. When helping hurts. Yeah. There's when a, helping hurts. There's yeah. a great book okay. called When Helping great. Hurts. Has nothing to do with business, probably, but it's more about. Uh, Sounds like it does. <laughs> well, it actually does, but it's about nonprofits overseas right. and just like how they create a culture of dependency in foreign countries, yeah. um, and it's really oh, fascinating. Is that Italian guy? Right no, uh, it's There's great. It, it talks specifically about Haiti and how all of the relief post earthquake. I mean, really, just killed the country. They have. There's a. There's a great story. Uh, I found out I think it's not true, but I, I love it so much I'm going to tell it anyway. But if you help a chick, a baby chick, baby chicken, mm -hmm. when it starts to peck its way out, if you open the shell for it, it will die. It has to have the effort of pecking itself out. And that's true. The true gratification, mm -hmm. satisfaction, purpose in life comes from accomplishing something. And if you're on the dole, uh, yeah, I guess that's a negative word now. But if you're being given everything, you're denied that. Yep. And that is not the ultimate way to help people. Yep. And so talking about firing again, I have a, a story about two companies ago, three companies ago. I hired a guy in a manufacturing plant as a hydraulic specialist. He was really, really good. Hydraulics is just like computer programming, actually. As a matter of fact, they can build a computer out of hydraulic components hmm. that makes decisions and everything. But anyway, this guy was really, really good. And then very before I even knew him very well, maybe three months later, we sold the company. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen him for more than maybe two years, and I was at the car wash, and he was there. I walked over, oh, and, I, and I'd heard that my, our successors fired him. And I'm like, what the? Yeah. Anyway, and I still don't know why or anything else. But I saw him at a car wash, and I go, man, I heard. He said, oh, it's the best thing ever happened to me. <laughs> He said, I went back and got my degree in radio, ra radiology technology. Yeah. And he's running CR, uh, CAT scans and all that. He said, I'm making more money. I'm wearing hospital scrubs. I'm not up to my elbows. And he said, best thing that ever happened to me. Wow. And he, he would never have quit and done that. But the issue is for So us. true, man. I mean, Every, you, Everybody you have... has a place, as they say, but your place is not here. And yeah. if they're not passionate, if they're not engaged, Let those go. are significant yeah. indicators that this isn't. Those this are those are the hard way. ones too. Those are the hard ones to fire because it hurts. It's like, man, but they just should try harder. If they're not trying harder, they're not motivated, they're not engaged. Right. There's so much more out there for them. Let them go experience right. it and approach it like that. I think I think the the importance of the the firing conversation is also that it's done fast. Right. That's the biggest harm to businesses is that if it, the longer you wait, you're prolonging your agony, the more you're going to be miserable. Don't and don't go into the conversation and make it emotional. You know, those it needs to be. Hey, I've got some bad news right out the gate. Right. That's your if, if you're if you're gonna do it right out the gate. I've got bad news, and not we will be firing you. We've terminated right. you. You know. Yeah. This is why. This is why. What? Uh, how can we help you out the door? How can we help you into the next endeavor? Yeah, and I I see that comes up a lot of times people well i'll give them a month severance or two weeks severance 
I've had my HR people tell me in past companies, don't do that unless it's part of your Employee formal handbook. policy. Yeah. Don't do it. I never could not do that. I always gave them some money. I said, well, so shoot me. Yeah. You know, give them a month or, or something. What I've done is, and it hasn't been a big deal for me with part-time employees, but I've just said, we'll, we'll finish paying you for the month. Right. Some, yeah. As if you were working, but right. don't feel like you need to. Right. Yeah. So anyway, that, uh, if you're out there and you're listening to this, uh, I've got an article titled, When You Know They Need to Go, and it helps you decide. It's a lot of what we've been talking about. Yeah. But when people do the bare minimum, when they obviously don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just, my dad had a manufacturing plant back in the early 70s. And I'll never forget, I was just getting out of high school. But he had a foreman, about 200 guys working out there. And one of the... Uh, one of the intermediate foremen kept wanting off and the the plant manager's name was doc dietrich and the guy the other guy was named tinker i still know him he's a great guy but tinker kept saying well i need off need off and doc says tinker he says i want you to take next week off get all this stuff taken care of and then don't ask me again no i don't need to know you take next week off Get all this, you know, whatever it was, whatever it's, get it all taken care of, and then don't ask me again. And Tinker uh, became, at a real young age, just a super important engaged employee. But I thought that was great. Yeah. You got all this stuff, go get it taken care of, and then we're done with it. Exactly. And that's a way to tell them this is how the cow ate the cabbage. Yep. And I'm not putting up with it. Yep. Absolutely. So, like I say, if the people are out there, you, you know, you already know who your wink links are. And, and another thing from the business coach, I get to say this kind of stuff, but why do you put up with less than excellence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, another test is you look at your employees and you say, knowing what I know now, would I hire this person? Yeah. If the answer is no, they probably don't belong there. Yeah. If the answer is yes or hell yes, give them a race before somebody tries. Absolutely. And just take excellence. It, it just always happens. Mm -hmm. Always happens. Somebody real close to me had to, had this decision uh, right at the end of the year, so December of 2020, and agonized over it for a long time for all the reasons we're talking. Oh, they're trying. They're not trying. They're making me mad. No, well, they did do it, but they just didn't do it when I said. Plus, I know them. I've known them a long time. They've been here for a long time. They were here when I said. All that kind of stuff. Finally pulled the trigger, turned it over to a young person, I said, you are now this kind of manager. And probably every other night I see this person and he or she, <laughs> I'm being ambiguous here, says, oh my God, what a rock star I've got. All these things I used to have to worry about. All the, yeah. you know, I assigned something, but it didn't get it off my plate because it now became due, it now became check to see if they did it. Yeah. And then check to see if they did it. And so you never, any, nothing ever really truly got off the plate. And uh, got the right person in there. Says, "Oh my God, it's coming to me with good ideas. They're doing things I never thought about doing. Yep. Rock stars. Don't you don't have to tolerate mediocrity. Yep. Now, in this day and age, I guess it's hard to find people. But we'll talk about that in another lesson. You can find people, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it boils down to paying what they're worth. Yeah, you know, you can't find somebody for seven dollars an hour is doing twenty five dollar an hour work. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that that'd be a topic for another one." But I think the, the main message to take away from today is if you recognize somebody's not getting it done, they're not engaged, they don't take initiative, yeah. they're not passionate about what they're doing, they're disruptive, uh, or even if they're nice but just can't seem to get the work done, yeah. you know that they need to go. And in my opinion, you need to take action sooner than later. Absolutely. I think one thing we haven't talked about as much, we've talked about you know the people that just don't fit but we're compassionate. I think there's also that fearful aspect of like, man, they they do a lot and I can't find somebody to cover all the stuff they do, but their attitude has just been really bad for the past two years. Right. But they, they do, you know, this role, this role, this role, nobody else knows how to do this. And basically you've lost all your leverage there because you should be relying on your systems, not on right. an all-star employee. And it's a whole another reason why you need to have systems so that whenever that person does decide to yeah, mess up, you're that's not a brilliant, brilliant point. 
Yeah. Brilliant point. And that, and the one who disappeared today, the text I got this morning, pretty kind of in that role. I'm not the only one who can do it, but the person who could do it and was available at, at this uh, location. And we talked a large part about it, and the owner of this business is has got a really serious three months coming up. Because, oh, yeah. oh, my God, i got to do it. But here's, here's a statement I got from my dad. Um, this employee kind of put my client in, a, in an ultimatum yeah. uh, situation. My dad said, my father always told me, he said, never accept an ultimatum, including mm -hmm. this one. <laughs> well, I don't know how to reconcile that last part, but you can't do it. Yeah. And it, once you do, you're kind of, who's the boss around here? Yep. You know, you're subject. So he, my client, did what he needed to do, and he's suffering. Yeah. But he won't be in three months. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's always, he's known for a long time that yeah. this was not a fit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think there's lots to learn from firing. I still have a lot to learn. I know I'm talking about this and giving my advice uh, and my quote unquote expertise. But um, I, I think I think there's still a lot for me to learn. We'd love to hear stories from people. Uh, we'd love to hear questions about things. Uh, maybe if there's an area we didn't cover that you'd like to know about firing, we can go in uh, and learn quite a bit about it. But um, yeah, anything else? I, yeah, I have to tell one story. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. And this counters everything we said, but I still got to tell it. Okay. I had a young guy as a client probably four years ago, and he had a person who needed to go. And we, we did all this discussion. You know, disruptive, doesn't show up, and engage, causing problems, all this stuff. I said, look, you have to dismiss this employee. Right. I said, pull the Band-Aid off. You know, that's that usually comes up in these conversations. Don't dribble it out. Just yep. pull the Band-Aid off. I said, look, you'll get on the other side of it, and you'll find out there was no problem. <laughs> so the next coaching session I saw him was on a Tuesday. He'd done it on a Saturday. I said, well, how did it go? And he goes, had to call an ambulance. I said, what do you mean? He fired this employee, and it happened to be a, a lady, and she had a panic attack and collapsed on the floor. <laughs> that's awful. <laughs> had to awful. call an ambulance. I said, well, <laughs> let, me, let me assure you that's the exception. <laughs> but anyway, so that one didn't go so well. But anyway, he's on the other side of it, and very thankful that he is. Good. You, uh, the, the office has a really great episode where Michael has to fire Stanley. But fake fake fires him in front of everybody, and then says, "Just kidding!" And like, it's a oh man, it's a disaster. So, yeah, it, we, it can go bad. Bottom line is, man, it, you know it's lonely at the top, and this is probably yeah. one of the most difficult burdens em employers have. You know, and, that's a, that's another point I actually want to make is like if you, if you're doing this as a small business owner and you're the one firing and all that stuff, it does make it a lot harder if you have systems for it. And then you also can hire employees that do the firing for you. It's less emotional, you know. You yeah. feel they feel less responsible. It's their job, you know. They're used to it. They're just following a system, and so that's something to aspire to at some point. Right. And if you can just act like that's how you are now, but you're in that role, it'll be easier too. So, yeah. well, appreciate it, Martin. Um, okay. Hope you for your questions. Way, fired. I'm yeah. fired. Yeah. Okay. I'm doing this. So, no, wait. That would be not in my best interest because I don't even know how to turn the mic on. <laughs> Ha <laughs>